Good morning. Uh, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners on the, of the land on which this event is taking place and elders both past and present. I would now like to welcome Ashley Rusker, an elder of the Nunakal Yuggera Nation, traditional custodian of Karilpa Point, to perform a welcome to country ceremony. Yeah, yeah, hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd also I'd like to um, acknowledge the elders past and present and um, just acknowledge any distinguished guests in the room today. My name's Ashley Rusk, I'm a descendant of the Yuggera people and for those who don't know, the Yuggera people are the land um, which we stand on today. Um, our land descend, uh, sorry, stretches from the mouth of the Brisbane River all the way up to the Great Dividing Ranges just at the foothills of Warwick and Toowoomba Range, back down to the Caboolture River and all the way through to the Logan River. Within the tribe, there are three different um, sub-clans, the Jagara, Yagara, and Yugarapul, and also the Turrbal people, sorry. And um, we all speak the same language, the Yagara language, but within Australia, there are over 350 different uh, Aboriginal countries, all speaking their own languages. Some have two or three different dialects. So it made it um, pretty hard to talk to each other back in the old days. So we used um, what we call a message stick, and um, one person in the tribe was allowed to travel from country to country. And he would have a small stick acting like a, what we'd have a passport these days. And um, this would just have markings or carvings on it depicting why someone would be in someone else's land. If you didn't have this, you know, there's a very good chance you'd be speared dead on the spot. But <laughs> lucky we got phones and all that now, we just pick it up. <laughs> But um, just on behalf of those, um, those tribes, the Yagara, Yagara, Yugarapul, and the Turrbal people, I'd just like to say, Yira Yira Ngamani, Inta Ganari, Na Badyara, Malinga Mindu, Inta Bayami, Na Dibira Lija, which roughly means um, you're welcome to this land, and may you walk this land in peace. You are. Thank you. Thank you. Just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll now uh, just go through some basic housekeeping uh, exits uh, at the back where you arrive. There are uh, facilities um, downstairs if you require them. Today, the, the pit briefing uh, includes four presentations, which will take us through till around 9.30. Following the presentations, we'll have a Q&A session until the conclusion of our pit briefing around 9.45, and then we can all adjourn to the foyer uh, for some networking and uh, coffee. I'm particularly pleased to acknowledge our special guest this morning, the Honourable Leanne Enoch, MP, Minister for Innovation, Science and the Digital Economy, and Minister for Small Business. I'll invite Minister Enoch to give her opening address shortly. We are also pleased to have two senior representatives from CIRO, CR, CSIRO's new Data 61 team joining us this morning. I refer to Mr Peter Lane, Director of Business Development and the Commercialisation and Principal Scientist, Dr Stefan Heikowitz. Following the Minister's address today, I will invite Dr Stefan Heikowitz, Principal Scientist in Strategic Foresight at Data 61, and newly formed research enterprise merging CSIRO's digital productivity team and national ICT uh, Australia, NICTA. Dr. Heikowitz will provide an overview of the fast forward to 2025 future scenarios for digital government report. This report was commissioned by the Queensland government to help guide government transformation and service delivery into the future. Following Dr. Heikowitz will be Mr. Andrew Mills, Queensland Government Chief Information Officer, who will provide a presentation on Queensland, Australia's leading digital government. Thirdly, we have Mr. Peter Lane, Director of Business Development and Commercialisation of Data61, who will present on Australia's place in a data-driven world. Finally, Mr. Dallas Stower, Assistant Director General, Strategic ICT, to City, will provide an overview and update of the government's ICT technology contracting framework review, which I know you're all waiting to hear. 
To start proceedings, I would like to introduce the Honourable Leanne Enoch, MP, Minister for Innovation, Science and the Digital Economy, and invite her to the stage to launch a fast forward to 2025 Future Scenarios for Digital Government Report. Minister Enoch has worked as a teacher, senior public servant and in senior roles with the Australian Red Cross and Queensland Government Council of Unions. She has a long history of leading the development and implementation of policies to support, support some of Queensland's most at-risk families. In early 2015, Leanne was appointed Minister for Science, IT and Innovation and Minister for Housing and Public Works. At the end of 2015, she was appointed Minister for Innovation, Science and the Digital Economy and Minister for Small Business. She is driving the advanced Queensland innovation reforms designed to create the knowledge-based jobs of the future, drive productivity improvements and build on our natural advantages. Minister Enoch is a proud new knuckle Noogie woman from North Strabeck Island and the first Indigenous woman to be elected to the Parliament of Queensland. I would like to welcome Minister Enoch to the microphone to launch this report. Um, I think every time somebody tries to say the whole titles of what I actually do, it takes up about half an hour, but uh, thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, let me also, of course, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, and in doing so, may I acknowledge the more than 3,000 generations of Yagara and Turrbal people who've maintained cultural practices on this country. And can I acknowledge all of our elders from wherever you come from, whatever your culture, uh, those that have passed and those still with us guiding us into the future. Can I also acknowledge um, Ashley, Ashley Ruska, uh, for this, his warm welcome to country. And, uh, you know, Ashley, it's this way of starting, of course, that uh, gives us the good spirit from which we can go forward. And I should claim that uh, Ashley and I actually are related from his Kwandamuka side. Um, so, you know, a little bit biased about how great he just was before, but uh, it was great that you were here, Ashley. Thank you for that. Uh, can I also acknowledge uh, Mr Peter Lane, Director, Business Development and Commercialisation, Data61. Mr Stefan Heikovic, uh, Principal Scientist, Strategic Foresight with CSIRO. Um, and some really um, talented staff from my department. Uh, Mr Andrew Mills, the Queensland Government Chief Information Officer. Mr Dallas Stower, Assistant Director General, Strategic ICT, DeCity. Mr Andrew Spina, who was very good at giving all of those titles. Uh, he's the Assistant Director General for Digital Productivity and Services, DeCity. And I know I have other amazing staff here, including Paul Russell and many others that are in the room. So uh, I acknowledge all of them. Uh, can I also acknowledge representatives, of course, of Queensland's ICT and digital industry here today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, can I start by saying that, you know, really it is a human, uh, it is human nature to need to know what's coming next. Uh, we try to predict everything from weather to sports results, I did very well last night with the Broncos, um, to our stock performance. Right now, our world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. So it's only natural that we want to know what our world and jobs will look like in the future. To do this, we rely on experts, like the, like the CSIRO, uh, to take a look at current trends and outline the future possibilities for us. In 2015, my department engaged uh, the CSIRO's Data61 team to study technology trends and develop scenarios on what Queensland government services might look like in 2025. I'm proud to say that Queensland is the first government in Australia to use a study like this as the foundation for building future digital services. CSIRO's report will guide us on our journey to be more efficient, keep pace with change, and deliver better customer-centric services. So let's fast forward a bit to the year 2025. I'll be a very old lady by then, but uh, by that same time, uh, technology will be embedded into just about everything we do, even more than it is now. Another billion people are likely to be connected to the internet, allowing us to reach and interact with a much larger audience than ever before. These newcomers to the digital space won't be coming online like we did 20 years ago. 
instead of having time to make a cup of tea while uh, waiting for a photo to download, they'll have super fast connections and access to all the services uh, we have now and many more we haven't even dreamt of yet. A vast network of sensors will be gathering data everywhere, giving us more insight into our world than ever thought possible. The phone you have in your pocket or in your hand if you're not listening to what I'm talking about, uh, your home computer and TVs will be far different uh, to what we use today. Wearable technology will simply be a way of life. Using our watch or glasses, if we have a question, need an update on our health or the optimum time to consume calories, good information I will need at the moment, will simply be second nature. All of these things will be connected on robust wireless connections, allowing for communication no matter where we are. This interconnected technology will not only change how services are delivered, but also give more people the freedom to work where they like. Some jobs will be made easier, others will be automated, and much of our current technology will be, will be replaced or become obsolete. We know this because it has happened time and time again. For example, 40 years ago today, and um, I think everyone in this room knows about this, an almost mythical machine, a supercomputer, the Cray-1, made its debut. Uh, its capacity set the machine apart from anything that had come before it. The Cray-1 uh, boasted more memory, one megabyte, and more speed, 80 million computations per second, than any other computer in the world. To put that in perspective for you, the Cray-1 weighed uh, five tonnes and needed a special room to operate from. Current smart watches and, uh, are thousands of times more powerful and, of course, fit on your wrist. So let's now return to the year 2025, but this time in Queensland. The forces that are reshaping our world will also affect Queensland and the government's ability to deliver its services in areas such as education, health, transport, and much more, of course. Much of what was done by conventional means, by letter, phone calls, and site visits, will be handled uh, predominantly by computers, drones, and other robotic devices. More Queenslanders from all walks of life will be online, and building eyeways will be uh, just as important as building highways. Customers will demand greater service delivery choice and a response in 24 seconds, not 24 hours. Or they will seek out uh, suppliers offering better services. That's a fact. And government is not immune to this shift. In fact, government may no longer be directly delivering all the services as we do now, but acting as a service broker instead, perhaps. Right now, we find ourselves at a pivotal point in history a place where the future is approaching much more rapidly. But we are going into this future with an idea of what to expect thanks to the conversations we are having with digital innovators, uh, IT specialists and educators, people like yourselves, who have made us more aware of the vast potential of technology. Those conversations are vital because they help the Queensland Government anticipate changes and maybe even orchestrate some too. Uh, it is one of the reasons why the Palaszczuk government has put such a focus on our $180 million Advanced Queensland initiative. Advanced Queensland is designed to prepare our government and our state for the challenges and opportunities uh, this shift, the next revolution, the technological revolution, uh, what this shift will bring. We're already taking steps to address the, techno the technology stumbling blocks and improve government services in preparation for the future. Our whole of government initiative has enabled an ever-growing number of customers to access an increasing number uh, of online services. Our open data initiative is encouraging startups, content developers and the public to make better use of government data. For example, to create service-focused uh, environmental apps and real-time public transport schedules. And with your advice, we're refreshing the government's ICT strategy so our focus is clearer. Speakers from my department, as you've heard, will update you on all of these activities uh, very shortly. But there is much more to be done. And with your guidance, I am confident Queensland will remain at the cutting edge of this global transformation. Uh, with that in mind, it gives me great pleasure to officially launch the CSIRO's Digital Economy Fast Forward Report today. Thank you. Thank you.
I would now like to introduce our second presenter, Dr. Stefan Heikowitz. He's a senior principal scientist working in the field of strategic foresight at Data61 CSIRO. Stefan's research and consulting work explores plausible futures and make wise strategic choices. His current and recent research projects have examined future trends and scenarios about jobs and employment property markets, the tourism industry, the construction industry, the manufacturing sector, water supply companies, agricultural industries, and food security. Stefan is a world-leading scholar in the field of decision theory and has published seminal works on the use multi-objective multi decision support. I welcome Stefan to the stage. Thanks everyone and thanks for the introduction. So I'm with uh, CSIRO's Data61, the newly uh, created entity of the merger of Nectar and CSIRO's ICT capabilities. My colleague Peter will give us more details on, on what that's all about. Um, but uh, look, we've had a great time working with the team here in Leanne's department uh, on this, this project, which is stretching out to the year 2025 to look at what Queensland looks like and how public services, healthcare, education, policing, transport, how these services are delivered in a digital marketplace of the future as we can see so much change happening. Um, the aim, as Leanne has said, is to anticipate this change and try and craft plausible futures. We want to bring evidence and relevance into the views of the future that we create. Prove to me it's happening, prove to me it matters. And that's, that's the sort of motto that we have in the team as we do our analysis. And partly it's quantitative, but partly it's qualitative thinking as well. So we went into a scenario planning exercise. It's a bit of a horrendogram for you, but we we basically uh, commence the work by understanding the current profile and the look of how government delivers services at the moment. And there's a huge breadth and depth of service delivery that goes on with the Queensland Government, touching the lives of millions of people and uh, involving billions of dollars worth of expenditure. So it's really important how this happens for the whole economy and for people's quality of life. So we have a look at how things currently look. We then get into the next stage, which is a horizon scan, where we cast a wide net over all trends that are starting to impact the marketplace for government services. And the trends might be political, economic, environment, social or technological. And probably technological trends dominate the, the analysis in this particular case, but, but we'll look across all those areas. Uh, the trend is different from a background issue and it's not just something that's there and has been there and will continue to be there. It's got directionality. It's taking us into a new space. So um, we, we analyse all the trends, screen them for re re relevance and evidence to, to, to make sure it's, it, it needs to go into the set. And then we identify, we have different ways of crafting a narrative of the future. We have done a lot on megatrends, but this one is scenarios. A scenario is an evidence-based story about what the future looks like at a set point in time. It's not necessarily the future we want, and I'll clarify that. Scenario planning is devoid of any um, objectivity about what we want to achieve. It tr just tries to explain what the future might look like. Um, and then we go into a communication phase. So a little bit on scenario planning and strategy with an example here that, that happens to a lot of us who go on car trips. But <coughs> this happened to us as we went up to Coolum. Three things that could happen on a family holiday. So we craft three scenarios here for ice cream, children and car trip. Now when we bring two of those possible things together, we can develop a, a strategic response involving the use of serviettes there with children and ice cream and that usually works okay. Uh, ice cream and car trip can be brought together with responsible adults taking normal care and we should be all right. Uh, car trip and children, we can do activity books and games. So there's there's three good strategic responses. Unfortunately, that one in the middle that we've tried never works and you end up with a sticky mess just about every time. So that's the challenge of government here is to put these scenarios that I'm about to show you together <coughs> and then ask the questions, can we build a strategy that sees government service del delivery continue to be resilient, efficient, robust and meet the needs of Queenslanders and improve over time? Can we, can we build a strategy that deals with all the different scenarios that are of the future and that's the challenge in scenario planning. Seldom do we have a, a strategy that has no residual risk. There is usually some residual risk, but via this process, we can reduce that residual risk. The next thing before I jump into the scenarios is to pick up on Leanne's point about the speed of change that we're seeing in the world. 
and so many companies and governments are coming to us with a question that goes a bit like this, who's our Uber? You know, they've seen what Uber has done to taxi markets and they're waiting for the next rapid disruption fueled by technology to happen in their sector. And that's, that's the entry point to a lot of the work that we're doing. So <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a bit of algebra and then I'll explain why. Uh, so we have a, a lily pond here, right? And there's frogs living in it. And a frog can't live in a lily pond when the lily pads cover the whole thing because it can't jump and catch fish. So it's a problem. We start with one lily pad, <coughs> pardon me. We start with one lily pad um, and we have an exponential growth rate. By day 19, the pond is half covered. On what day does the pond become fully covered by lily pads and therefore dysfunctional for the frog? It's actually day 20. So if we do, a, do that exponential growth <coughs> in a graph, <coughs> we can see it looks like this. So. For the first 14 days or so there, so this is just a cough that is not going away, but I, a glass of water wouldn't, wouldn't hurt, yeah. Um, my brother's head of in, sorry, it's catching too, right. It'll probably make its way to the end row by the end of the session. My brother's, my brother's head of infectious diseases at Royal Brisbane and uh, won't let me touch antibiotics. So, because he, he's worried quite rightly about antimicrobial drug resistance, but he won't let anyone in the family have it, so. I'm doing the right thing <laughs> by the world. So uh, for the first 14 days there, Frog doesn't know anything's happening. It feels great. And this could be the government. This is the company. We're, we're, we're not picking anything up yet. But then by 14 to 18, the frog suspects something's going on in the pond. By 18, the frog is diagnosed and has got to make a jump to another pond. Now, in a competitive marketplace where there's lots of other frogs, if they've been able to read that signal earlier and make a jump earlier on, they're in a much better space. So the strategy and foresight team that I've, I lead inside uh, Data61 is, is concerned with trying to examine that flat line and determine whether it is just a flat line or whether it's something about to take off and, and what impact it has, because early and proactive action is what the whole thing is about. So let's jump into these four scenarios that we crafted collectively with the team uh, in the Queensland Government here. Um, <coughs> we went through that process I described and um, put, put out the trends to the year 2025 and then crafted these plausible stories about what the marketplace for the delivery of government services look like. So remember we're, we're thinking about basically how does government deliver health, education, transport, accommodation, community and other services by the year 2025. Hugely important for the well-being of Queenslanders and also our economy, how well these services are delivered. You know, this is, government's not the only player, but it has a very significant role in, in how this happens. So <clears throat> we push all the trends out and we identify axes of key uncertainty and impact, things that are unclear how it will play out, but things that will have a big impact on how the services are delivered. And we construct two axes there, which are like continuums of possibility. In the scenario planning literature, one analogy is like we've got dominoes all lined up and we drop something in the middle and the dominoes spread out to each end of, of possible outcomes in the future. So that's what, what an axis is like. So the first axis that we construct from the data we look at is the extent of digital immersion and the capabilities, I guess, inside that is really the capabilities of information technology and artificial intelligence. How good does it all get? How connected does it get? And how, how deep does it invade all the areas of service delivery from, from deep to shallow? And in the following slides, I'm gonna try and argue why we could end up at both ends there. Um, <coughs> but I will point out that we do not see a world where there's less technology penetration than today. So both those ends of the axis have taken us to a world that is more technology enabled and more um, greater penetration. It's just that at the shallow end because of cybercrime potentially or because of um, data overloads and the NBN not keeping pace with the data transmission it needs to, that's where it's a bit bumpy. At the other axis there, we look at the institutional change which has independence of the first axis and this looks at essentially things like the peer-to-peer -peer economy. Do we see the new platform economies which are global in scale, really take over. And you know, the colleague of mine with uh, it's, it's CSRO's Data61, Andrew Reeson, we're writing a journal paper together uh, trying to challenge Ronald Coase, who did win the Nobel Prize, so we've got a steep hill ahead of us. But we, uh, we want to challenge the theory of the firm in that it's, it's, 
it's basically been a long-standing theory in economics about why we had big organisations and group labour together. It was down to transaction costs and asymmetries of information. Platform economies take away those transaction costs. Um, they, they allow us to, to buy. You know, I got two scooters from a Chinese company somewhere in China and the, chi the website was all in Chinese. I did not trust or understand anything about it, but I didn't have to trust them. I had to trust the platform that sat between me and them, which was AliExpress. And they go a long way to, to making that. So um, it, that transaction worked, and I'm using more transactions and, and buying quite cheaply through this, this mechanism. I think it's, it's got a lot of growth ahead of it. But the point is, is that um, <coughs> the trans I could not have found that company um, the, via a massive search effort ever possibly before. So the platforms are taking away some of those transaction costs. So that's the two axes here that we play with, the extent of institutional change, the extent to which the marketplace is transformed by the, the Ubers and all the next ones that come after it, and then the extent to which digital information and, and artificial intelligence really is able to, to go into, the, into new areas. So we create these four scenarios. The bottom left is where things stay close to where they have been, and that's heritage. So this is a world where we haven't seen that much of the digital revolution occur, and we haven't seen the peer-to-peer -peer economy take hold. The next one uh, is new order. This is where we have roughly today's technology happening with some improvements and changes, but not a vast amount of change. But the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace has taken off like never before, and it has completely changed issues of contestability for government services. There's a lot of new market entrants, and a lot of them aren't even in Queensland or Australia. There are, there, there are players providing these services from around the world. So how, does, how, do the, how do the institutions respond? We also see within organisations, both public and private sector, quite a lot of change in the way they're structured and how they do their business. Um, the next one called turbocharge is a world where we have the same institutional structures, similar market structures, similar dominant players out there, uh, but they are fuelled by uh, advanced artificial intelligence, robotics, algorithms, data science, you know, the data science creeps in. There is, there is a view that data science eventually takes over consulting firms and uh, a lot of the work that happens, it all starts to become about data. You know, in the field of economics, they say we've kind of given up on theory and we just look at data now, uh, as do the ecologists, as do physicists and, and so forth. So it's quite a profound change in science around data science. Uh, the fourth scenario there we call Stargate. And that's where everything changes and goes completely kind of into a very exciting and different world. Not all, all good, I would point out. There are massive challenges there, and a big one is around social equity. Does everyone make this jump into the new world? And last Friday, we launched our report on the future of work, and we, it's called Tomorrow's Digitally Enabled Economy, and it's very exciting. It paints some great pictures for new jobs growth, but I do think there is a, an issue in front of society about is this only for a couple of people who manage this digital hurdle and clear it, or is this broad-based? And there's a lot of choices that we can make on how that occurs. So let's, let me try and um, argue for and against about why we end up those different axes. So deep, why do we on that horizontal axis go, go deep digital penetration? First of all is the amount of data and the impact of data. Uh, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day, 90% of data last two years. If we finish that, that graph there is data moving around on the Australian internet from 2010 to 2015, if we do a projection, we need another 75 metres on the graph to 2025 to finish, um, to, to, to get the forecast out there. So, and that's a, a key issue for the National Broadband Network. It's not moving, it doesn't need to move today's data in 2025, it needs to move uh, exponentially more. Let's look at computing power and speed. Leanne gave us the, the uh, example there of the Cray computer and how, how quickly that's changed and how my watch is, is more powerful than that now. Um, it follows an exponential growth curve, just like the frog in the pond experienced. That's Moore's law, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit, which doubles the same cost every 1.5 years. Uh, and NASA, Google, reckon they've built a quantum computer. Some scientists don't reckon they have, they reckon they have. There's a bit of a debate going on in the literature. Instead of binary on-off, it's got qubits, which can be at multiple states at one point in time, so it's like a dial that can be uh, lots of different positions, and it's a, a radical shift in, in how the computer operates. Um, if it does happen, computing speed, you know, 10,000 10, times faster uh, would be an approximate of, of, of the jump that we take, which changes what all the software can do as well. The other thing is the internet of things that we're moving into. <coughs> but, I mean, we go from 
2 billion devices plugged into other devices 2006, 15 billion in 2015, but we're about to make this massive jump into a device connected world to 200 billion devices plugged into other devices globally. Uh, so Metcalf is a theorist who came up with the functional theories around the functionality of a network. Uh, and uh, one of the examples that is used to explain that is faxes, where we had one fax machine, it does nothing. Two fax machines, simple network with a little bit of functionality. 45 million faxes, which I've discovered is close to peak fax before they start to decline again, is um, uh, a network which then allows the law firm in Jakarta to close the deal with the one in New York and transact business in a new way, and a new business ecosystem is possible in that. The theory is that, that there are emergent proper properties that are above and beyond just the gadgets, that the network itself starts to have value. Now, the internet is not just faxes getting plugged into faxes, they hardly exist anymore, it's everything getting plugged into absolutely everything else, including my watch again, is, is connected and part of this live internet of things. Light bulbs that are, uh, have ethernet connections are available as of last year. There are washing machines with ethernet connections, so you can wash your socks on your iPhone during a meeting if that's, uh, can't find them, but it can wash them. Um, but that in and of itself, you know, the washing machine being able to do that isn't real significant. But if all the washing machines in Brisbane were talking to each other and working out the optimum times to turn on and off, then we might save a lot of electricity on the grid. So the point is that the network has functions above and beyond. The other thing <coughs> is the, the reach of robotics is, is, is moving really quickly. I, we do in the report talk about um, Watson, uh, at the IBM program Watson. What we emphasise is how quickly from 2006 to 2009 the team were able to take it from being a non-starter to always winning on Jeopardy. No human will beat a computer at chess anymore. Today's chess tournaments is one computer playing another computer with a third computer explaining what's going on to all the mere human beings who have got no chance <laughs> of following it. Robotics is making its way into the battlefield where it's proving effectiveness in agriculture. I went to uh, Christchurch a while ago to the University of Canterbury where they had a vine, vine pruning robot that could go down a vineyard and scan the, that's the big cost if you're a vineyard owner, scans the vines, pulls out some scissors and works out where to clip and it was rated by the vineyard owner as 95% uh, better than the human. Narrative science are building tools that can write newspaper articles automated. So <coughs> it's the, the extent of automation will go into Queensland government service delivery as well. That a lot more that we can't automate yet will get automated and the cost of automation will go down. So there is a job replacement story there. I guess I, I should also put a link to our report, uh, Tomorrow's Digitally Enabled Workforce, which is available for download on the Data61 website. Uh, this, this tells the story of what jobs look like 10 to 20 years out. And it's, if you're a parent, it's very good reading. If you're, if you're a teacher, in fact, if you live, it's a good report to read because, and want to work. It, um, it, it tries to p apply all this, this uh, thinking to, to job markets out into the future. But there is, there is the view that 44% you know, or so of jobs are gonna get done by robots and computer better, better than you. That's around five million jobs in the Australian workforce and we're entering into a period of rapid transition. There are some things that robots can't do and I'll move towards the shallow end uh, here to try and emphasize the, the failings. The team at UC Berkeley um, uh, over a seven year period had the challenge of building a robot that would fold a towel uh, they kind of set themselves this challenge and they had a lot of smart people with good equipment working on it. And after seven years of effort, the best time they achieved was 20 minutes. And it's kind of comical, you can watch this on YouTube and it, this, this poor robot is trying to work out where the corners are and <laughs> tackle this problem of folding a towel. Now, <coughs> now, it's not to say that the only jobs we get to do is fold towels in the future, but we do um, differentiate. And this will be there for the Queensland Government as they look at the workforce, the huge workforce of the Queensland Government, I think there'll be, how do we transition people out of the rules-based repetitive tasks that we can automate into different ones? And this happened in the photography industry, right? So in the photography industry, we have people in the, the back office in the laboratory who develop film and print film and do fairly rules-based and structured tasks. Now, for the bulk of us, when we order a photograph, a print hard copy photograph now, uh, no human is involved in the process. You upload the digital file, um, you describe the size and uh, whether you want it framed and so forth and then you hit print and buy and a machine creates it and posts it back to you uh, and no person is involved. But the other part of the photography industry, the photo photographers, the field photographers who go out there and take the pictures, that's a very different skill set. Uh, 
they have to have social intelligence at a wedding to be able to know when to take a photo and when not. They have to know, if they're a nature photographer, they have to have a sense for beauty or for what might be interesting for the person behind. And that's, you know, just as <coughs> 20 minutes to fold a towel, robots and computers are very, very far uh, from getting close to, to a lot of the things that a field photographer has to do. And it just, just won't be likely to happen. So there is a lot that, you know, if I can bring the analogy back to public service delivery before I go on to the next issue, there is, there is much that becomes more important for the human to be doing in the delivery of public services. And there's also, a, a, at the other end, a human being. And that's where you know, the big banks are actually, they're downsizing the um, transactional staff in the back room, but they're reloading a lot of the skills onto the, the front office uh, because that's where the value and differentiation lies in this digital economy of tomorrow. You know, everyone has the same algorithms playing around with blockchain, which is something we absolutely want to get into and look at. Uh, everyone is running the same algorithms, but they, the differentiation bit is the human interaction, and that's where the load will go. And I think for the, as we looked into job markets, you know, part of what a nurse does, for example, might get automated. We don't want to lose that nurse. We want to do what all the patients are saying and give them more nurse time and interaction and help in a different way. So if the, you know, the vitals and the, the blood glucose levels and the heart rate and pulse rate is all being monitored electronically, shift the time into the interaction with the patient. <coughs> okay, so uh, shallow as well. Cybercrime I'd call the untamed tiger in the room. You know, um, it's most Australians have been a victim of cybercrime cyber and it is growing. A lot of people in this room will have been victimised through cybercrime. Um, most, a lot of it is actually people doing, doing stuff. You know, there's still people who respond to the Prince of Nigeria when he wants to, you have to give him $5,000 and then he's going to come out and give you five, it still hasn't come yet. Um, but most of it is human, human error. But there are still high tech components to this. And I think, you know, I do, I do want to move into playing around with scenario planning on the how bad can it get with cybercrime factors. You know, the, do we all wake up one morning and check our bank accounts and it's, it's zero for you, it's zero for you as well, and we're finding broad-based across the population and we can't correct for it, and the trust and the fear factor that would follow. I'd like to try and, try and experiment a bit more with that. But <clears throat> um, that is certainly something that could change this digital future of, of this digitally immersed economy. A big cybercrime shock could turn us off and people may not be willing to interact with government on a digital platform if that trust and confidence is gone. The other thing is this world of digital immersion is digital overload. Um, digi we're, we're becoming exhausted and overwhelmed with our online connectivity. And I don't think unplugging is really an option, but people do want to try and unplug. Uh, and the good service delivery models make a lot of the technology invisible to the person who's the customer of the service. And that's, that's what, you know, we, we gravitate, the, the gadget comes along, we get very excited in building the platform to provide the service, but quite quickly for it to work, we've got to take the emphasis off that and where it really matters for the customer and their experience factor that they're getting. So those are two ends of the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is then an institutional change we get. Well, that's Ronald Coase, who we're trying to challenge um, and rewrite the theory of the firm. But there's a lot of, lot of people questioning this, and probably Ronald is as well, in that when he wrote that, the world looked different. Today, the, the basic principles that created firms and the structure of firms have changed. There is a future where I don't work at CSIRO and you aren't with your employees, we're all freelancers. And I've got about four or five different employees that I respond to on a regular basis. I don't go into the same office building to work every day. We, we have um, Qantas-style lounges through Brisbane where we swipe in and out with our credit cards. And if the group of us here are working on a project together, we'll team together, work on that project uh, until it's done, and then we'll disband and form another another group. I think something a bit like that is closer to how the office environment plays out in the future because, because of the power of connections and collaboration that exist. So uh, the, the institutional rules could change a lot. Uh, the new platform economies are there, uh, and showing just incredible rates of growth. Uh, I think it's yet to really happen in the finance sector. Uh, again, the finance sector and what makes a bank happen is a lot of it is regulation. Uh, Uber didn't care about regulation and plenty of other platform economies won't and they can establish quite quickly. So 
<coughs> freelancer.com is one there as well, showing incredible rates of growth, setting up co-working spaces in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, where people can do work and compete on the Australian marketplace for jobs, for, in, for web design and all sorts of things that are done. And this, I don't think there's actually any wall that can be built to stop this. It will find its way around one way or another. Uh, and it's a reality of, of the, the new economy. So part of this institutional change thing for Queensland Government Service Delivery is the connection to the world uh, that happens via these services. That, that the, the service that we're supplying, we might start to find, can be done by anyone, anywhere, uh, quite well. And the frog in the pond example applies here too. Uh, Uber, in January this year, a couple of months ago, Uber released their driver data, and we see a flat line till 2013, and then the explosion. So the, com the taxi companies absolutely had to read that flat line earlier and build all the same sort of technologies. And they could have, but they didn't. And that's, that's the challenge. But you know, the who's your Uber question, you know, I reckon they're out there for CSIRO as well, uh, if we, we look at it. And I think they're out there for a lot of consulting firms. And we have this, it's, it's exciting, but we've got to build these disruptive models and drive them ourselves. <coughs> There's also the issue of, organisational redesign and rethinking how the organisation works, primarily down to what I'd call the innovation imperative that, that just goes through government, it goes through CIRO, private sector, that, that the next wave of wealth creation in Australia happens via ideas and knowledge, uh, as the, you know, partly because the mining boom is over, but Australia's economy is moving into a new space. We've had a long period of productivity growth up until about 2005, but since then productivity declines. And uh, the fuel source for a modern economy like Australia is, is ideas and, and innovation. So it's causing us to, to stop and really, do I have the, I don't have the next slide on the sort of implication, but we're looking at organisations, redesigning them around the concept of innovation to be able to allow them to rattle the cage, try new ideas. Uh, the fast fail and lean innovation concepts have heavily found their way into CSIRO where we get an idea, a design, build, experiment, put it out there, fail and expect to fail on the first one, then start again and recycle again, do it again and do it again. And if the team building it needs more than two pizzas to feed them, it's too big. You want to keep the, the size of these teams low. But it's a change of organisational structure and the innovation imperative applies equally to government as it does to CIRO or any, any private sector organisation. So it will drive a lot of institutional change. It's a question of how we innovate to keep pace with it. Um, Let's go to the other way uh, about why, why we may not see the institutional environment change so rapidly. Uh, we spent a lot of time, there's probably too many graphs and stats up there, we spent a lot of time in the Future Work Project trying to work out whether the peer-to-peer -peer economy, was, the freelancer model was going to take off in a very big way. Is this something that is half the workforce or two-thirds of the workforce potentially? It was quite hard to answer. We couldn't find any data of it yet. And there's a bunch of articles in The Economist that kind of come to the same conclusion. The Economist Intelligence Unit has had a good look at it too. And they say, we can see why it will happen. The, the, the theory and logic is there, but we can't find data. It's because we're not really measuring it. National statistics bureaus aren't picking up this activity in the peer-to-peer -peer economy and the, the freelance work. Freelancer data all shows rapid growth. Um, but you can't really get too, too much into it. So we, we can't see it yet, but it may be on its way. The other thing <coughs> is these peer-to-peer -peer models still have quite a few hurdles to clear. Now, AliExpress has cleared the first one for me because I bought five things and it all worked. And they're about, I don't know, 20% of the price of stuff that I've been buying here. So, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not paid by them in any way, but, but I think it is interesting and they have a lot of effort around clearing trust. When, when you purchase, it starts clicking down from 20 days and if you haven't clicked got it, you get a refund and then it goes into dispute resolution. So that makes you trust them a lot more. Um, and that's, that's the model. If they win trust, they'll win this massive marketplace. They're not, it's eBay and Amazon and lots of others there too, of course. Public relations, uh, they have to clear that hurdle. Quality and reliability perceptions, government regulation is still there and competition from long-standing incumbents. The long-standing marketplace incumbents, let's say if the next round of disruption is really in the financial sector with the banks, um, they may move, and they are. They are actually building and developing these models. Whether they're really going to be capable of it or not, we're not sure, but I think we can't dismiss the fact that long-standing standing incumbents can build the platform models as well. Lastly, organisational momentum and the oil tanker nature of something as big 
as government. It doesn't change and turn around quickly. History has shown us this. Um, as for any big organisation, it doesn't change or turn around quickly, including my own. There are very big issues around momentum that are hard to deal with. So by 2025, that's, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of quantify or put too much around that, but by 2025, not too much might change. So <coughs> those are our scenarios, and I try and explain why we could end up at different ends of those two axes to make four plausible scenarios. The challenge, and I think uh, Andrew's going to jump into to, um, uh, explaining this, is what does this mean for how we do government and what strategies do we set? How do we respond to this story of the future to ensure that government service delivery continues to improve and develop over time? Thanks very much. Do we have questions? Okay, I'd now like to um, introduce Mr Andrew Mills, uh, the Queensland Government Chief Information Officer. Andrew provides strategic advice to the ICT Minister and agencies on the best way for governments to use information and communication technology to, um, yeah, to deliver improved services to Queenslanders and drive efficiencies through ICT as a service. He has extensive experience in strategy and policy as well as program, project, contract and sourcing management, operational line management, service delivery organisations. Welcome, Andrew. I reckon I've drawn the short straw. Dallas thinks he has as well, but um, following Stefan is always very difficult. And I will, uh, forgive me, when I, before I start, I actually have the same cough as Stefan. We were in Melbourne together at a conference two weeks ago and we both brought, I reckon, the Melbourne cold back with us. So forgive me, I've probably got the same challenge. Um, in some senses, I could actually just stand up here and say I'm going to give up. Um, it's, it's a really difficult situation. Um, and I've been in this industry for now 40 plus years. And um, I get scared as I go. Um, the rate of change, 20 years ago, we knew we could plan five to seven years ahead. It wasn't going to change that quickly, and anything we did would probably still survive that. The challenge is uh, systems, capabilities, solutions can be obsolescent in the next two to three years. And in fact, interestingly, one of the, the conversations we've started having is how we manage obsolescence as well as how we manage the new. And that's the other challenge for us, is in government, we have one of everything. Um, the challenge has been that we haven't kind of stopped doing stuff to go through this and, and, and work into the new digital economy. So we're layering stuff over and that's part of the momentum conversation we've been having with Stefan. I'm not going to try and cover everything that um, could come out of uh, the, the, the fast forward uh, report. What I'm just going to do is try and cover a few areas where we're doing some work and I'll finish off coming back to the fast forward report and how we're going to uh, try and use that. Um, so the, the first one for us is, um, and I'm going to, I think I've got the right button, yes. Um, as the Minister announced, we're, we're started, we have started work on the future strategy um, and it's going to be a very, very different beast to where we've been in the past with strategies. Uh, very often in government, strategies were basically a list of actions to fix problems we, as we saw them today, so they were kind of fairly action focused or they were a grab bag of everybody wins a prize. Um, in a strategy, we needed to cover uh, such a broad aspect. So, we started a process called Envisioning Our Digital Future. Uh, my team are leading this on behalf of the whole of the city. It's not about just government business, it's about how does uh, Queensland government and both do its own business but also influence the future. So certainly working closely with Paul's team, um, but also linking in and making sure we link in with Advanced Queensland. Um, we've, we've kicked this off, um, done an extensive analysis of what's going on around the world and what strategies look like. Uh, and uh, late last year, we, had a, we started a co-design process with, uh, and some of the people in the room were there. We had 60 to 70 people in the room. Uh, not, front, not all ICT, some, but a lot of business people to discuss where they thought it was going. Um, and we've done a, a lot of surveys, uh, particularly of 500 plus of, uh, of public servants statewide. And interestingly, what's been really positive is places like we've been, had a, a good, solid regional response from uh, the education organisation uh, in, the, in the state government, which is uh, facing these issues. Uh, that work's ongoing. Uh, it, we will be soon coming out with a, a um, set of uh, uh, frameworks and for conversation around a, a series of themes that have come out of that work. Um, 
We've got a whole heap of themes up there. Uh, this is all draft still, um, and probably too many themes, but we've got to work our way through, and so we'll, and I'll invite you, once we come out public with those themes, for your comments and your feedback. We try to encapsulate the thinking that's already done and put that in. Step after that, we'll start looking at which of those will have the biggest impact uh, and do that assessment and supported by a fair bit of research around that space. Go through what implementation and working our way through. The key challenge for us, though, is actually um, how do we measure this? And the, for those that read uh, government documents and go and look at what our, the order generals around Australia are actually saying to us is actually one of the things we're not good at is measurement of, uh, of what we do and how we implement. And so a key area for us and our a key area of research is what does, how digital is Queensland? How digital is the Queensland Government? And will this next action actually increase that or reduce it or have an impact? So a cyber security attack is likely to reduce our digital uh, uh, immersion and, and future and by going more digital services online will take us up. So we're working through those issues. And, and interestingly, the key challenge that we're finding is there is reasonably good approaches and data at national levels, and there's reasonably good approaches and data at city levels, but there's not much at the regional level. So we've kind of got to work our way through how we measure that. So that's a key focus uh, going forward. And we'll, in a sense, that's the feedback loop, and going back to Stefan's comment about data science, um, we'll be working a whole heap of, uh, through that side. So back to the scenarios. Um, I'm using the, the older slide. I quite like Stefan's new one, so I'll have to pinch it, uh, I think. So, so basically, um, these scenarios. Um, the challenge for us is we actually don't know which of these scenarios will happen. I have a suspicion that it is actually the fifth scenario, which is sitting in the middle of that uh, diagram going, all of these scenarios will be happening somewhere in government. And that's the key challenge. We really don't have a choice, and I, I actually believe. Um, for the... The, the vertical axis, um, I have a bit of a suspicion that we may be on the lower side than the higher side. Um, governments look the same since 1850. Um, there really hasn't been much organisational change. Our external relationships have changed dramatically. Uh, some of the tasks of how we do tasks have changed, but our uh, current structure hasn't changed. And actually, part of that structure, um, I'm not sure we'll see a difference in our, the way democracy works in Australia and how the government, actually executive government works. So it might impact on the bureaucracy, but will it impact on the other side? So the real challenge for me is, and the next step, is what do we do with this now? We've got it. Uh, how do we use this as a tool to help us work our way forward? And so the next set of work, which uh, we'll be doing in, in conjunction, uh, hopefully with Data61, we're in the conversations, is how do we actually use this to start assessing uh, investment, uh, future directions, um, where do we put our best efforts to actually make sure we meet the scenarios? So uh, a wind tunnel, a funnel of some sort that we can actually go through a structured process to, to assess any major future direction against each of those scenarios. Um, I would suggest that no strategy, investment or future direction will meet all of those scenarios equally well and not have risk involved in that. So, but at least it's the start point of the conversation going, OK, if we do it this way, we will meet three of those, but we will actually have a real risk in the fourth. And so starting that conversation about where we can put those investments or if we adjust our strategy going forward, we will be able to at least uh, not have a major risk in any of those four scenarios. Uh, and that's going to be a really challenge. It's if we just head towards one of those scenarios, the, the Stargate uh, scenario, I think we will have a big danger of having some people left behind. So, and I actually, working through. So, so we're going to be working about its performance across all scenarios and then how do we work that through. So it's a, it's a, it's a tool. And so we're going to be working on a tool and work our way through, but it's not just for the strategy, it's also for the next layer of decision making as we work our way through that. Um, uh, I think that's really challenging. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to be working through that, but I see that also as a, an incremental approach. Also, I thought I'd just, in fact, leading into Peter's talk, um, th there's been a lot of work going on uh, within uh, the city on behalf of government and for our work uh, with Data61 and the new organisation, which you'll hear more about after this, about how we integrate, how we uh, achieve the best outcomes for Queenslanders and Queensland. Um, a whole heap of issues we're talking about, right from data science through to the future of sensors and what they're happening, 
uh, how we develop skills uh, and what are those skills and how can, what's the best intervention, if there is any, that we can have in that space uh, for across the industry. Um, how does our innovation future uh, economy building activities slot well into the Data61 research. So a lot of that work's going on and where we work that through and, um, and I th we're getting to the stage where um, we're kind of starting to solidify uh, what that looks like. Uh, we can't do everything and so certainly working that through. And in a sense I'm also now leading on to a bit of Dallas's conversation. Um, for us to be successful we need to be able to leverage uh, what this industry and what this audience can deliver for us and do it better. Uh, and actually we can't do it the way we're doing it now. Um, so we're looking at moving ourselves, we're not, it's not going to be revolution, it will be evolution as we move our way through um, and working our way through. So certainly the as a service uh, and cloud uh, approach is still uh, where the government's heading. Uh, that policy hasn't changed. Uh, we're starting to see that picking up. Um, and interestingly, uh, if you've been watching the press recently, we've been criticised for not doing much cloud and criticised for doing too much cloud, so I'm not sure where we're sitting at the moment. I think we are actually sitting between the two uh, and we're working there. So, so certainly we're seeing a whole heap of cloud work going on at the, the edge within the business uh, to meet business needs. Uh, we're not seeing quite as much happening quickly in the core, but that will start happening and we're starting to work that through. And to give you one example, there are now nine agencies uh, either already or going towards uh, cloud-based uh, collaboration and email capability. So in a sense, uh, we're starting to see that work. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, cloud-based capabilities and assessments. Uh, uh, 0365, Google Mail, base, uh, we're using uh, tools like Basecamp, Rike. Um, one that's probably taken off the most is actually board-type software uh, for DGs. It's interesting, we're starting to see actually the take-up at senior levels probably much more than we're seeing it at, at the lower levels. Um, and as I said, we're, it's a lot of work going on in, uh, onboarding 0365, particularly the mail services for agencies. And the last one I uh, try to look at, you look out the window, there's a building with about the roof about to go on it and um, six and a half thousand government workers, I think about Dallas, 5,400, I'm going a bit too high, uh, going into that building, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, going into that building for uh, later this year um, and we've actually taken a very, very different approach of delivery of ICT in that building. Um, one of our local su uh, suppliers is busily working away setting themselves up as a, basically an overlay supplier to the buildings that all uh, agencies will take uh, the base technology and connectivity uh, from that supplier. So, uh, and by the way, every minister and DG plus staff will be going into that building and four agencies, four full agencies will go in. So it is actually a truly multi-tenanted building and uh, we're using that as a, a trial to look at how we work and collaborate better in the future. And in some senses, the first step towards peer-to-peer, -to -peer, getting people to actually work beyond their boundaries and work together is a key focus. And interestingly, a very high level of decision to put ministers and DGs in that building together. Um, so an, an interesting step, I th think we can probably separate them later, but bringing people together to let, help them co collaborate is an interesting step. Um, so questions, uh, there's our email, uh, and I'll now pass on to the next speaker. Okay, I'd like to introduce Mr. Peter Lane, uh, Director, Business Development and Commercialisation, Data61, uh, a CSIRO entity formed from CSIRO's digital productivity team and NICTA. Data61 is now the largest data innovation research group in Australia. Peter has worked across Australia and Asia in global ICT companies, uh, Hewlett Packard and Autodesk, developing markets for new technologies. Prior to joining Data61, Peter held several senior leadership positions in the New South Wales Government, including heading the Office of the Director General for Water and Energy, Director of the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer, and Director of the Office for Science and Research, where he drove policy development and program delivery in environmental management, renewable energy, and research commercialisation. Welcome, Peter. Great. Well, thank you. I, I too had the syro flu, so I brought my water with me. Uh, I'll see how we go. Um, so my job uh, is to work out how to use the button. 
big one. Ah, excellent. It's to give a bit of a uh, the Data 61 vision. We're, we're, we're kind of this really big startup at the moment where we're still working out uh, uh, how to operate and, and you know, we haven't really even been out there uh, talking about ourselves too much yet because we're, we're still sort of uh, working, it, working it all out. So uh, I'm going to share the vision of Data61 with you, but before I do that, I've got to do a couple more stat slides, just a little bit of context. I'm not going to try and out megatrend Stefan, because I know I'm going to lose that one. Um, but this is, the first slide here is just about uh, the value of IP. So uh, this is from uh, S&P 500 companies uh, back in 1975. It was all about bricks and mortar. It was all about plant and you know, what kind of valuable assets you had. Uh, these days it's less than 20% because it's all about intellectual property. Cisco in 2013 released a report on the Internet of Everything, which is their version of the Internet of, of Things. But it's like you know, the value up for grabs uh, statistic here is 14.4 is, is trillion, that's US dollars. So we'll, we'll make that about 20 trillion Australian dollars, but it doesn't really matter, it's a lot of money. This comes from uh, lots of things, uh, including uh, employee productivity gains, uh, better, better use of infrastructure through, through sensing technologies, and then all the new industries that come out of uh, you know, placing sensors everywhere and, and, and uh, getting data and analysing that data. So it's a big opportunity ahead of us, something that's kind of unprecedented. Um, the next slide is, is, relates to the kinds of companies that are scaling and getting value faster. So if we look at um, uh, sort of the, the last five years, companies that are getting to $5 billion market cap in roughly uh, a third of the time that other companies, the GEs of the world have, have, and IBMs of the world have got there in the past. Now this is phenomenal. And I think in most of the examples that you would find of, of that happening, it's all what Stefan said in platform economics. It's, it's the Ubers of the world, it's the, the Facebooks, it's the Googles, it's these platform economic companies that are, are just changing the rules of the game. Uh, so Accenture did some, some research. They went out to, to a couple of thousand uh, uh, companies around the world and said, well, 87% of companies believe that they were going to be disrupted by digital technology in the next five years. The scary part of this is that only 7% uh, had any kind of plan to deal with that. And I think this is the same sort of thing that's going on with governments. And it's great to see uh, the Queensland government recognising that it needs to have a, a really serious plan for, for digital disruption. We've got to look at our natural advantage here, and the, the natural advantage we have is, is geographic. I, I like to look at this slide and, and look back to 1990, and um, the, the percentage of, of, uh, of GDP in Asia came from three, the most of it came from the three countries, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and Japan. I don't think New Zealand contributed too much, and I think Japan contributed the most. But you look at that sort of light, um, light beige band, and take it forward up to 2020, and we're actually just a really small part of the opportunity now. The, the big opportunity is coming from, we know it, China and, and, and India as they, uh, as they grow, uh, but also in ASEAN and some of the, the new, uh, newly industrialised countries. So we've got this great opportunity, big market in internet of everything and massive, massive uh, uh, spending budgets coming out of, uh, out of Asia. So what do we see as Data61's role in all this opportunity? We see ourselves as uh, a hub for global R&D. We've seen R&D outsourced, uh, sorry, we've seen outsourcing of, of HR systems and, and payroll systems and finance systems. The whole world is outsourced, but what we haven't seen is, is the outsourcing of R&D. So we've got a really simple goal in the team. We just want 0.5% uh, of global R&D spend. Global R&D spend is $1.6 trillion a year. So if we get that, we're, we're, we're laughing, really. So we're doing this across a, a whole lot of areas, and, I, and I'll, I'll jump into a couple of them for you. But this is real. So uh, Boeing's had a relationship with CSIRO um, for, for about 40 years. Done $130 million worth of outsourced R&D for, for Boeing. Um, you may not know that CSIRO, the paint on every Boeing plane is designed by CSIRO. Um, the wingtips, the fibre uh, the wingtips on that go up, uh, they're, they're all CSIRO. And yet we're doing a whole lot of stuff in Data61 now with, with Boeing uh, in the world of cyber security and big data analytics. So we can do it. This is, a, this is a real thing. So the big change, I think, from us is that this isn't 
CSIRO or Data61 is just another institution trying to go and grab the money. We actually want to share this opportunity and see ourselves as a, a platform for innovation that's not just us, it's us plus everyone else. Um, and I think that we're in a unique position being, uh, you know, a, a federally funded um, a statutory authority to be able to do this in an independent way. We don't want to grab everything. We want to make sure that the Australian economy uh, benefits from all these opportunities. So we do that through our uh, academic network. We have partnerships with um, uh, just under 40 universities around the country, including you know, uh, most of the Queensland-based unis, uh, where we have a PhD scholarship program. At the moment, we've got over 300 uh, ICT-related PhD students under our scholarships uh, across that university network. We're, we're, we're training the skills uh, of the future. Would, I spoke about Boeing. We've got corporate partners uh, by the dozens. We are also recently announced a startup support program, uh, and we partnered up with 12 incubators and accelerators around the country, including uh, River City Labs, for instance, here, here in Brisbane, where we're actually opening up our IP vaults to give, them to, the start, to give that IP to the startups to help them uh, move ahead and create their new businesses. And then the last tier there is, is government. And we're working with, uh, with governments around the country to say, well, how do we co-invest, co-locate, be involved in the policy development and the skills development and, and bring governments forward in their service delivery? So it's, um, it's wonderful to be so having these discussions with Queensland kind of multidisciplinary research that goes on inside of Data61. Uh, I'll grab a few of these, but uh, you know, Stefan's report was launched by the, the, the Federal Employment Minister last week uh, on the future, the Digital Futures uh, Workforce Report. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot in cyber security uh, under the, the federal government's new uh, funding package for the National Innovation and Science Agenda, or NISA. Uh, we've been given uh, a lot of responsibility to, to lead cyber security uh, skills development uh, for, for the nation. It's a big responsibility. Uh, in the fintech area, we, we, we work with all the major banks and we've got teams deployed in major banks doing, uh, you know, helping them with cyber security and, and data analytics. Um, through to the work particularly here in Brisbane in robotics with our, our, our QCAT centre. Uh, doing a lot of robotics at the moment for, for the MET sector, but looking at how we deploy that out to things like dig digital agriculture in the future. And on and on it goes. Um, we're, we're really uh, operating across the entire economy. And, and the last slide here is to show you kind of the scale of the operation that we've got now. We're about 1,100 people. And so when we say we're Australia's uh, digital innovation powerhouse, uh, we mean it. So this is uh, including our PhD students, uh, around 400 students in that number, which makes for a really um, uh, vibrant work environment. 31 government partners, not just in Australia, but, but, um, but globally, because there's more than 31 uh, uh, governments in Australia. Um, well, less than 31. Uh, our corporate partners, our uni partners, are a very important part of this. Again, we are a platform here that wants to work with the entire ecosystem to benefit the ecosystem. We've got over 190 projects uh, going on inside, uh, which is hard to keep a track of and hard to understand how we uh, take that out and communicate 190 different pieces of research to the, to the outside world. And we've got a great little uh, patent portfolio and, and things like Wi-Fi, which is you know, the team responsible for that sits inside of Data61 now. The, the royalties that we're getting back from that that we're able to reinvest back into the system is, is um, a real advantage for us. Um, to me, the, the future is nothing but bright. And this is a photo we took just a, a couple of weeks ago. In, this is uh, actually in our um, Sydney labs, where we, uh, we, we run this uh, girls' programming network. And this is a, a bunch of girls, uh, most of them 8 to 12-year-olds, who come in on the weekend. And we, uh, we do this as a, a free thing. Some of the staff just like doing it. Um, they were actually, this weekend, they were doing um, cryptology coding. <laughs> stuff which just blew us all away. So yeah, I think the future is really bright for us uh, in this country and we just sort of all get together and, and, um, and exploit that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, our next speaker and last speaker is Mr. Dallas Stower, uh, who is the Assistant Director General for Strategic ICT Division in the, in the city. Dallas has significant senior ICT leadership experience across a range of roles and organisations. 
He is currently leading government reform through SciTech, ICT renewal and strategic sourcing, the One William Street project we spoke about and the government wireless network program. Dallas has over 30 years experience in the ICT industry, commencing from the Department of Defence in Canberra to a number of senior IT management roles within the Queensland State Government. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I thought um, coming after uh, Peter and Stefan and, and Andrew would be a tough act to follow, but I've realised that um, you've all been hanging out for hear about GITC. That, that <laughs> I've deliberately in place at the end so you all hang around, because I'm sure you want to hear what I'm going to talk about. Um, so what I want to briefly give you a brief update is um, where we're at in terms of our GITC refresh. Um, so just as a reminder, here's just a quick recap. Um, so last year we engaged uh, BDO to do some work for us between May and August and um, that was to look at, I guess, answering the, the one question that's there, what is the right contracting framework for ICT procurement for the Queensland Government? Um, so that work was, was undertaken, undertaken and so that from that uh, review there are some outcomes that highlight a, a few things that we need to do uh, moving forward and that is uh, highlight the need for a new um, or significantly modified GITC framework. It highlights the need to look at how we can provide choice um, of contract forms based upon the risk level and the value of those contracts. It highlights the need for, our, for a streamlined uh, processes for pre-qualification and accreditation uh, by reducing the current two-step process to a, uh, a single-step process. Um, it also highlighted you know, we, to look at those circumstances we're again simplifying procurement where we could look at under what circumstances we would accept vendor terms and conditions uh, for contracts. And, uh, and also, I guess, uh, highlight again the need to look at how we can streamline the process of forming ICT contracts. So, where are we at? Um, or where are we at in, at this point in time? So, we've um, completed that GITC review. We then, uh, we then moved into stage one. Um, so the process of refreshing GITC is that three-stage process. We did the review. Uh, there are three stages um, following that. Um, stage one was all about shaping the direction moving forward. Um, stage two is we're about to move into uh, between March and, uh, and, and October this year, and that's about taking um, that shaping forward, doing some extensive industry consultation around uh, the form of contracts, and then we'll move into the final stage, which is actually implementation. Um, part of stage one, though, um, there are a range of things that we uh, encompass. So there were a number of quick wins that have come out of stage one. Um, and those things uh, include making it easier to access information around GOTC. So there's been some work around improving um, websites, etc. Um, we've um, also acknowledged, and, and Andrew touched on, uh, on his presentation around the need to sort of look forward in terms of different methods of service delivery. So we've, uh, we've looked at adding things around um, you know, cloud services type contracts uh, as part of, uh, of module 10. Um, I mean, we've also um, looked at upskilling uh, capability within government around procuring ICT. Um, so we are taking advantage and leveraging um, some, uh, some expertise that our legal firms on the legal, uh, legal tenders have around, uh, around uh, contracting. So the city's uh, coordinated a range of, um, of information sessions. So there have been nine information sessions for those people involved in ICT procurement. Uh, within government, um, and they've been run from March through to uh, to, uh, to June, and there are further 10 of those information sessions which are planned from July through till December. Okay, so there um, there are some uh, some other quick wins there in terms of uh, of um, of how we might shape um, some of the the core elements. So. Um, one of the other things we've also done is to, um, as well as providing those, 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 those workshops for procurement people, we've, uh, we've developed a little prototyping decision-making tool. So for those people involved in government in procurement activities, that takes, uh, takes those people through a little bit of a decision tree to help them understand in what circumstances, what different types of contracts they might use. So you know, for 
um, takes you through a process, uh, you know, in terms of using a general form contract for those um, contracts which are of, of uh, low risk and less than a uh, million dollars worth of value. Um, takes you through a process where you, when, and tells you when you need a more comprehensive contract, if the procurement activity is of medium risk or is above a million dollars. Uh, also provides some guides in terms of in what circumstances you would use vendors' terms and conditions. Um, stage one also was about um, helping to shape um, the, the core elements of GOTC moving forward. So there had been a fair degree of consultation that had taken place uh, with industry through uh, various working groups, etc., um, to actually do that kind of work. So um, this slide here just is a, a quick summary of the, the range of people that we had engaged with uh, within government, um, people with uh, procurement or legal background in government and also um, those people in the industry that we engaged in in terms of that process of, of uh, forming up where we need to go for stage two. Um, so from industry, we had representation from small, medium and large um, groups as well as industry uh, associations and uh, we also involved people who had expressly um, expressed interest in being involved uh, when we shared the, uh, the results of the GITC review. We learned some lessons from stage one um, and uh, some of those lessons have been around how do we apply the principles of co-design. So co-design brings both benefits and challenges. Um, so we're seeking to, to learn from that. Uh, some of the things we learned is we, we, uh, like this, when we were doing some of this work, we continued working before and after the end of financial year and we worked uh, some work through Christmas, New Year. That didn't exactly work for some stakeholders and we didn't exactly always be successful in getting the range of, um, of, of input and, and uh, I guess a cross-section of view. So um, we'll be cognizant of that moving forward into stage two. We're conscious of the amount of time and effort and demands that we might place on stakeholders uh, when we're seeking views on the GOTC framework moving forward. Um, and we will make sure that we uh, allow sufficient time um, and turn around when we put stuff out for review. Um, we, as a result of that, are looking at working on uh, developing the engagement process for, uh, for stage two um, so that we can make best use of everyone's time. So we'll, we'll consult on that. But I guess the point is um, we are looking at refreshing GITC. We are, this whole process is about pushing our thinking. We're trying to think outside the box in terms of more innovative uh, ways to do uh, contracting around procurement to simplify that process. So there are times when we won't get that right. Um, and we need to acknowledge that and we need to have some honest discussions between ourselves and industry and get some honest feedback in, in terms of that. And so um, I guess we're taking an agile approach. So we'll take that feedback on and we will um, we'll modify accordingly. But um, uh, at the end of the day, we don't want to lose sight of the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So. Um, as I mentioned, we are at the end of stage one. Um, we're about to commence and we're doing planning now for stage two. Um, our intent is that we will um, 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 work with um, stakeholders to see how we'll do the engagement process um, going forward. Um, co-design the co-design process, if you like. Um, um, we would uh, like to be seeking some suggestions from industry uh, and government on the engagement process moving forward and, uh, and how we can improve that engagement process as we move forward. Um, there's been some questions, and I'll talk a little bit more about engagement in a moment. Um, there's been questions around the governance process uh, for the GITC refresh and also for stage two. Um, so, as, uh, as any good ICT area, we take a program management approach. Um, so we've got a program manager that is uh, that's managing um, the GOTC ref refresh process. We're applying program management principles, so therefore we've got the, what you'd expect in terms of program governance that, uh, that sits across this process. But we've also got some advisory um, components there as well. So during stage one, 
Um, we had uh, a, name, a number of advisory groups from industry and government advising us um, on the process going forward. We will continue that process through into stage two. We'll have our normal program governance that will sit across this activity so that we can manage it towards a, um, uh, a completion. And um, we will also be looking at uh, having um, some advisory groups there as well to advise us through that process moving forward as well. Um, because we are seeking to do a fair degree of consultation, I forgot to mention on the previous slide that we anticipate that stage two uh, will take between six to eight months um, of that consultation. We'll put things out there. There'll be a, a, a period of time for people to review and, and send uh, comments back. And then stage three will be actually implementing um, the framework when we've got that concluded. So in terms of engagement for stage two, as I kind of mentioned before, we want to get a, a broad range of, um, of views. Um, so we need to, to get uh, the process we have agreed the engagement um, timing and approaches for each of the elements of the, uh, the framework. So as I mentioned, we'll, we'll co-design the co-design process. We'll do some quick exercise to make sure that we've, that we've, uh, we've got a, an appropriate engagement process in place. Um, we want to make sure that all stakeholders understand their roles um, in this process moving forward. And uh, we also want to make sure that stakeholders can understand how the feedback uh, or how the input they uh, provide us and feedback, um, how that has been uh, listened to and acknowledged. So we will we'll work through that process. So if you, wa if you want to be involved, um, we are starting the process now in terms of uh, calling for nominations from stakeholders um, to be involved in the, um, in the co-design process. Um, and on the next slide, in the final slide, um, here is some contact information. So there's an email address there um, if you want to email your interest. And uh, there also is a web link there that um, you can go to and get more information around the GITC review. So uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, so now's the chance for you to ask some questions. Um, so I'll ask um, Stefan and Peter and uh, Andrew and Dallas back onto the stage if they could. And um, we've got a number of minutes for those of you who wish to ask some questions. So far away, we do. We... Any questions? I'll just ask you to speak up so everyone can hear. That's quite a wide range of topics that we covered right through from GITC to the future of, future of Queensland. So, got a question over here, a couple. Yeah, can you just speak up so we can, yeah. Okay. You, Andrew. That's actually me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm sure I'm sure that people here would like to, to have a discussion around that. But um, so there have been there have been um, so in my role as um, um, assistant director general for digital productivity and services, uh, one of the things that um, uh, the Queensland government has been focused on is um, uh, reimagining customer service from the customer in. And um, so uh, a lot of the work that we have been doing uh, to date has been around just some of the foundational activities to make that a reality, and that has been um, driving um, services um, uh, onto a digital platform um, as the first step to be able to do that. Um, and um, so there we have been successful over the last few years in um, uh, essentially transitioning over 300 government services to online uh, space and we're currently um, working with um, uh, with the um, um, government leaders to determine where to from here so it's using some of the information that we spoke about before the fast forward report 
in terms of where should government be positioning itself, uh, looking at um, what customers' behaviours are and what customers' expectations are. We're spending a lot of time looking to understand um, what we need to do as a government to be able to meet those expectations. And what's becoming obvious is that just a drive to push the existing services that we currently provide face-to-face -face online is not going to be sufficient to meet people's expectations. So um, watch this space. There's a lot of discussion happening at the government level to yes, transform I think services. Just federal activity is going to change customer behaviour very rapidly if they go ahead with what they're doing at the moment. Look, I think I, I think you're right. Experience. I think at the federal level, but um, mm -hmm. uh, customers take their lead from um, um, uh, from the services that they receive from financial institutions and re retail outlets, and they're not necessarily looking to the government to be the leader in this place. place but um, the expectations are definitely rising as they can do more and more in the sharing economy, but also just in the the, the straight transactional. <laughs> that they can undertake with other institutions, they want to do that with government as well. And they want it to be more personalised and they want it to be more proactive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I directed a little bit towards uh, Andrew. It was just towards the end of your discussion, you mentioned about the new government building we've got. Yep. I'm, it concerns me, because I work a bit in security, that we're, we're putting all our eggs in one basket. We've got one building which is going to basically control Queensland, <laughs> and we'll, there'll be one conduit perhaps going in. I was wondering what provision was put in there to make sure that nothing's going to happen so someone with an axe can go clip and then Queensland's cut off because we're going towards a digital future and therefore these things are incredibly important. So what redundancy we put in place to make sure that that building will always be connected to the rest of us? Uh, one, I don't have anything to do with the physical security, so I suppose I'd leave that to... Um, uh, more qualified people, but I'm not sure they'll even answer the question as well, um, because uh, that issue. Um, certainly the overlay of uh, security is key to where we're going, and part of that work has been working our way through those issues. Um, one thing I had, didn't mention, and I suppose it's probably want, want to mention, the Governor announced several weeks ago uh, a, a new investment in improving cyber security within the Queensland Government, uh, and so there is actually a new team forming within uh, my office that is going to um, we're calling it centre enabled, not even centre led. Uh, each agency will need to look after their security issues. If they're, we're not taking over agency ICT inside that building, by the way. We are providing a base capability that agencies will then feed back into their agency. So it's not a it's not a consolidation and a centralisation. Uh, please be clear on that side. Uh, so, from my, so the government is uh, has recognised uh, that security is a key issue, and I think. Uh, Stefan covered it very well about some of the risks and issues, and so we're working through those issues, and, and, and it's an improvement program. Um, the, the, the one statement I quite like in that space is um, that uh, being hacked will be a for is a foreseeable event for any organisation that's connected to the web, and we need to accept that and work our way through how we manage those issues. Uh, so, in a sense, we're taking the approach on One Win Street as we do across the board, protect what we can. Um, where we can't protect, detect, and, uh, and once we detect something going wrong, respond as quickly and as uh, capably as we can. So it's a, a very st structured and focused approach and working with our partners. And, and certainly one of the conversations with Data61 has been, uh, what's the future look like? How do we improve that? Um, certainly uh, we know that we need to do it differently than we do now, um, but what that looks like is uh, still a bit hazy. I might just add to specifically answer the question is, yes, there is network diversity. And I guess you've got the cloud there as well, right? So. <laughs> okay, any other questions? We have a couple over here. Do you want to just wait a second? I'm just interested from a government perspective how the central agencies are working more closely together to provide, I guess, the funding to um, the funding mechanisms and to be able to work together to provide more strategic options together and even give opportunity for industry to put skin in the game so that um, <coughs> agencies can be more responsive and react more quickly to some of the changes that need to take place to deliver services better. Because often we're restricted by, you know, funding cycles, 
um, you know, our strategic procurement options, even our strategic options in terms of delivery. Can I just can I just start yeah. start <laughs> an answer to that one? I, th I think it I think it does, but I, I, um, there was one of the slides that Stefan had up there, which was the um, I think it was an oil tanker. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and look, I think we would all agree that um, this is not something which is going. Government's not going to turn on a on a dime here. Um, there will there is obviously a, um, a strategic approach to turning that oil tanker around. Um, but I can say that in pockets that I can observe that there are actually changes that are occurring and and. Um, and government's moving swiftly. Um, I know the government at the moment is grappling with the issue of um, uh, yeah, opportunities for person, personalised transport, for example, which is looking at, well, what do we actually do with, with Uber? So th that is really using the decision framework around the fast forward report you know, on a very specific example. What do we regula regulate? What do we actually need to do here, if anything? To, um, to manage that process, and there are a lot of stakeholders that will be impacted quite, um, quite dramatically as a result. So um, I think there's a, an awareness, I can say. Uh, um, someone um, may wish to, Andrew can add. I, I, I think the, the oil tanker is a, a good analogy, but there is changes happening. Uh, certainly a lot of conversations going on about um, the balance between the old model of a big bucket of money being provided uh, to do a big job versus uh, a much more incremental approach of agencies going in and going, this is what we think it's going to cost, it's a big issue, but we need this amount of money to start. Uh, so that's, that is certainly starting to happen. We, uh, there was one program the other day which actually is going through, it's changed from a, a big bang system replacement into, and it's probably forever, uh, kind of, we've got to be open about these issues. So, so within the constraints of how we operate, and I think that, in fact, if you go look at fast forward, uh, we are sitting at the bottom of uh, the, 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 the organisational change, um, how we work those issues through. So we've got to be, become smart of, and, and I have a lot of conversation with people is, in the past we tried to operate as a single enterprise. Government is inherently federated. Um, if we actually do acts that don't match that way we do business, they tend not to work. And I think that's been one of our challenges. So, a lot of the conversation now, and particularly from the centre, is how do we make federation work? And so I will go back to one Williams Street, it's a classic thing. That's about federating people, it's not about centralising. So the, the identity of every worker in that building belongs to the agency. They will manage it. We are figuring out how to bring them together so it's seamless for that person to move in and out of that building. So, so in a sense, I think that recognition, and if you go back 10 years, we had a, I think all governments had a, want to go, we'll do it one way, one size fits all, we'll kind of impose over the top, that's certainly changed. And I think that model will get us, give us some strength. I will come from the other side though, um, we haven't in the ICT organisation covered ourselves in glory and how we've governed ourselves in the past. Um, so I think there is a long way for us to go and to improve the maturity of governments uh, across the board. And I don't think it's just government, I think it's across the board in this space. So. Um, for us to actually be able to change how we do business, we'd better get some trust from the people who make decisions. And the way to get trust is actually to do our job well. And so I would suggest that we need to implement good, solid governance to start with and then figure out how to modify it to meet the future. Can I just throw one other thing into that? The sign behind me, which is Advanced Queensland, is actually um, uh, the government articulating how important the knowledge economy is for the future of Queensland. And um, so that doesn't apply just to the broader economy outside of government. That sort of thinking is being applied internally to government as well. Another question to say? Yeah. There's, there's a hand up just behind there as well. Otherwise, we've got one here. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, there was a saying in the lecture that um, the Australia trying, there was a, a plan to grab about 5% um, of 1.7 trillion of global, <laughs> uh, global R&D expense. 
Uh, is there any strategic plan for that, or is that a federal government plan, or just our Queensland state government plan? Yeah, so, so it was 0.5 of a percent, but, um, <laughs> and that's just a Data 61 plan to, to, to take over the world. But um, we think it's a, it's a very realistic uh, thing. What we're looking for is large, large corporates. We, we, we're very much, as part of CSIRO, we're focused on uh, benefit to Australia, but we need to have a global context in which we look at the world. We need to realise that there's a lot of opportunities outside of Australia that we can, we can tap into um, to create jobs and... and um, and, and knowledge in, in, in the country. So, uh, yeah, we, th we think this is a very realistic uh, thing. We, and and I, I spoke about us being a platform. When I say 0.5% uh, of, of 1.6 trillion, um, that is for our network and those in our network. So they can be startups that are, that are part of our network, it can be our university partners that are part of our network, uh, and, and Australian uh, SMEs and corporates. I just think this is what we have to do for the country. Uh, we, we have to stand up and, and stand up together and, and go and take on the world. Thank you for that. Are you working with other state governments as well? Uh, ab absolutely. So we, we have strong partnerships in place uh, in, in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, Tasmania and, and, and ACT, and, uh, and, a, and a strengthening relationship uh, with, with Queensland. If that gets, gets going, will that stop lots of big, con uh, big corporations like uh, outsourcing to other countries, lots of IT jobs? Um, uh, yeah, so that's a, pretty, that's a pretty open question because what is an IT job? Uh, I think you know, we've, we've always got to be, be thinking about uh, being at the high end of the IT skills spectrum. Uh, we're never going to compete with uh, with, with the low end of the IT skill spectrum. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's definitely where we play is in the, in the, the PhD and the higher end of the skills and, and being the innovators um, rather than, um, you know, maybe outsourcing of, of simple software development jobs. So I think we just have one more question. We could. It's just... just mm -hmm. can, can, I, can I just make one other point sure. on that? I think where, if I look at the Brisbane... Um, IT community, I think one of the strengths that we've identified here that we want to invest in and, and, and build on top of is, is functional programming. We actually feel like the, the Brisbane is actually the, the world epicentre of functional programming. And so the, when we say, what are the jobs that matter, let's build on where we've got strengths and, and unique capabilities. And, and we sort of see that that's just naturally evolved here in Brisbane. Right. You partially answered my question, which was oh. of all the areas of research, which areas do you think Australia has a particular competitive advantage in? <laughs> and so, um, look, I think we, we, we do, and Stefan, you can jump in as well, but I think um, you know, d definitely in the autonomous systems and robotics, I think we've got to step up in cyber security. We've got some, we've got some great pockets of research, but this is really the, the elephant in the room. We've got to get better at it, we've got to invest in it, and, and, and we are uh, going to invest in it. Um, I think in the communications area, we, we've got a, um, a strong history. Um, I, I think there's some other little niches which are really interesting, things like spatial, geospatial um, uh, analytics and, and visualisation. We, we're good at that because we've got a big country and we've had to, we've had to do things smart, and I think that's also an area where where Brisbane has a, a natural advantage over the rest of the country. But I think it's pretty diverse. Uh, we, we've, we've got a lot of investment in the medical uh, and e-health area. Uh, so, you know, Data 61 and CSIRO are here in Brisbane, has its e-health, National e-health centre. Yeah. I could go on. Okay. <laughs> All right, look, I, I, will, I will close it there because we've reached 9.45 and um, um, I invite you, if you do have some burning questions, I know there were still a few there, um, I'm sure that um, Peter and, and Stefan, who didn't get a question, no, 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 he just absolutely nailed it with that presentation that everyone's still <laughs> thinking it over. Um, I'm sure they'll be happy to take a question. So I invite you to grab a cup of coffee. Let me thank uh, our speakers today. I thank, um, obviously, the Honourable Leanne Enoch for attending. Um, you will receive a survey about today's event, so we will welcome your feedback. Um, and if you wish to contact the PIT team for any future inquiries, please do so. Um, thank you to the team. So um, thank you very much, Paul, and everyone who um, uh, put the event together. Uh, and um, uh, thank you.
for, for coming along today. Cheers.